Well, welcome back, everyone, uh, for this panel. Uh, so in the last panel, we talked about a whole variety of renewables. This time, we're really going to focus in on hydropower and water technologies. And there's, I, you're in for a treat. There's lots of interesting stuff going on. And I always learn so much from all of these folks. So I uh, am anxious for you to have a chance to hear them as well. And of course, they all are part of exhibits in the expo room. Uh, so please, please visit them. We're first going to hear from the National Hydropower Association. Uh, and we are going to hear from two people who are presenting together on this, Leroy Coleman, who is the Senior Manager of Strategic Communications and at uh, National uh, Hydro uh, Association, NHA. And, and coupled with him will be Trey Taylor, who is the co-founder and president of Verdant Power International, uh, one of their members. Leroy. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Is this on? Uh, you got to push it. Is this on now? OK, I have a lot of information, so I'm going to try to get through it as, as fast as humanly possible to, to keep, us, keep us on schedule. Um, <laughs> Well, welcome, and thank you for having uh, us here, uh, National Hydropower Association. Uh, we are the united voice of the hydropower industry. Uh, we advocate uh, for improved regulatory and legislative policies to protect and foster a growth for our nation's largest uh, source of clean, renewable emissions-free electricity. Uh, we represent more than 200 uh, members. Uh, both public and uh, investor-owned utilities, independent power producers, developers, manufacturers, and suppliers. Uh, we also have councils that focus on small hydro, pump storage, marine energy, uh, wave, and uh, tidal technologies, which Trey is going to speak about as soon as, uh, as soon as I get done here. So what is hydropower? hydropower? Well, at its core, hydropower harnesses uh, energy from flowing water and it converts it to electricity. Now, many of you recognize hydro in its traditional forms from conventional, from dams, uh, which they store water in a reservoir. When the water is released, uh, it flows through and spins through a turbine, turning a generator, and it produces energy. Uh, there's also run of river hydroelectric facilities, uh, which meaning the river isn't dammed. Uh, and there's also uh, pump storage, which kind of works like a battery. Uh, what it does is it charges, it charges like a battery during the evening when energy is low and water is pumped up. And then at night, sorry, we love, we love Canada. And we don't, we don't want to. Uh, and at night, when, or excuse me, during the day when uh, there's more use for energy, it, it comes back down. Uh, so capacity, where are we at with hydropower, hydropower today? The U.S. hydropower fleet, federal and non-federal, has a capacity of 79 gigawatts, providing over 30 million American homes with affordable power each year. It's uh, actually, it, I should also note that hydropower generates more than half of the nation's renewable energy. Uh, flexibility. Uh, as a renewable, hydropower is unique uh, and, the, and for its grid flexibility, uh, facilities can quickly uh, go from zero power to maximum output, making them exceptionally good at meeting rapidly changing demands for electricity. So what's our potential? Well, hydro has a lot of potential. Right now, there are 80,000 dams across the country. Only 3% of those dams, roughly maybe about 2,400, are equipped with power generation. 80,000 dams, 3% have power energy generation. So that means our potential is real. According to the Department of Energy, we could increase our generating capacity by 12 gigawatts through the addition of power generation on non-power dams, or roughly maybe a little over 4 million homes. So what's keeping hydro from reaching its full potential? Well, we have to address meaningful and much needed license, licensing and regulatory improvements. The current process has evolved into a complex and time-consuming process with duplicative processes that can increase costs to the point where a project is no longer cost competitive or able to uh, attract investment. Licensing a new hydro project can take up to 10 years. 10 years, which is longer than a lot of different energy options, such as fossil fuels. And frankly, no one should be satisfied 
with a process that stifles one of our most important renewable energies. Um, and NHA has called on Congress, as well as all stakeholders, to come to the table to work on a solution. At the same time that we are, I don't think we can have a real conversation about climate change unless we are addressing hydropower. Hydropower is helping the nation avoid over 200 million tons of CO2 annually. That's the equivalent of over 42 million cars each year. Meeting climate change uh, mitigation objectives, uh, including the national uh, reduction goals proposed by the Obama administration, will require continued and expanded hydropower. Um, the good news is Americans love hydropower. We can be excited. Clap if you want. That's great. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, our polling has, has found that over 81% uh, support existing hydropower, as well as 75% 75, 75 uh, uh, are in favor of expanding hydropower. So that's kind of a quick overview, and uh, Trey Taylor was going to talk a little bit more about marine energy. Thanks, Leroy. So marine energy, you hear it described as ocean uh, wave power, kinetic hydropower. So let me describe marine energy, but first let me tell you about our project in New York City. We've been working on this project for 15 years. We would have been commercialized by now had not the uh, uh, recession hit in 2008. So that set us back. So where we are now, we are on the verge of commercialization. We're going forward in the marketplace, but our market is not the United States. Our market is overseas. Uh, marine energy will continue to grow overseas because that is where the political will exists. It doesn't exist here in the United States. We will be coming back to the United States once we lower our costs overseas. And then, and in so doing though, in the meantime, we will be creating jobs here for exportation. And I'll be getting, getting into that in a minute. Um, it's, uh, marine, what's interesting about marine energy is that once we do create it and coming back, we'll be creating also affiliated jobs associated to marine energy and hydropower in the water energy food nexus, and also powering microgrids and smart cities. And so let me explain what this is all about and the role that hydropower, marine energy, a subset of hydropower will play. The drivers are this, it's globalization, it's the IT revolution, and it's climate change. And again, I'm going to go back to this issue of money because that's what's keeping all this bogged down. It's America's short-termism. Uh, real quickly here, uh, we fancy ourselves as a country of innovators, and yet as a percentage of R&D, uh, money for innovation, R&D is declining rapidly. Corporations are not putting money into R&D because of short quarterly short-term profits. It's shareholder values that come before long-term planning innovation. And yet the world is moving fast beyond where the United States are, but there's an opportunity for us. I'm going to explain a little bit further. As Leroy pointed out, hydropower currently is one half of renewable energy. And renewable energy's path uh, in the next three decades is putting it on a path to be one-fourth of the world's power will be coming from renewable energy. That's just a fact from the Energy Administration Administration, Energy Information Administration, and hydropower again will be playing one half of that. Uh, hydropower has grown from 27 percent in the last 10 years, and it's continuing to grow to the points and the opportunities that Leroy pointed out. Kinetic hydropower, as a subset of that, um, uh, is hydropower's answer for distributed generation, and it will grow sevenfold in the next two years. Uh, in the next 10 years, the Electric Power Research Institute says the potential for kinetic hydropower is 23 gigawatts around the world out of a market potential of 250 gigawatts. So the market is just absolutely huge. Where my company is going is we have projects, our project pipeline is lining up in Turkey, in Ireland, in Canada, in the UK, in China, not in the United States. And that pipeline, within the next 10 years, will be 1.7 gigawatts that we already have starting to get onto contract. 1.7 gigawatts represents $6 billion, just for our company, and that's only 7% market share. So you can see the opportunities that are out there for this industry, for this subset, for my company. However, uh, and, and also the reason for that is marine energy, hydropower, its, it's practicality, reliability, and predictability really acts as a, 
uh, base cornerstone, if you will, for contributing to distributed energy resources. And the answer for the world, quite frankly, is distributed energy resources powering microgrids. Microgrids are the answer for grid resiliency and security, integral to strengthening the economy. And that's where the world is going, decentralized power, microgrids, distributed generation. The global economy is growing too. Not, and here's an interesting statistic to think about. 90% of the world's consumers reside outside the United States. 90% outside the United States. Side question here, only 1% of America's companies export, yet the biggest market is outside of this country. The middle class, too, is growing. Our middle class is shrinking, but the rest of the world's middle class, less than a billion people now, it's growing to over 3 billion people in, within the next 10 years. And with a growing middle class, that means more electricity use, more demands for clean energy and water. So you can see where the opportunities are. So, so let me share something else with you, and it's an export. I, I also participate at the White House Small Business Council. And on the White House Business Council, this is something we've learned. Amongst all the companies there, we did a poll 70 to 80% of the people we employ is for the purpose of exporting our technologies and services. This is not jobs leaving America. It's jobs being created in America for technology and services like building in incremental hydropower behind dams in Turkey that aren't currently producing power. That's the business. And by doing that overseas, our costs begin to come down so we can begin to apply them here in the United States. Right now, we can't do it because the costs are too high cheap gas, fracking, you get the picture from a, from a business point of view where we have to go. So what are we exporting? Now, something else to share with you, and this comes from my background. My background is this. I used to work for the Edison Electric Institute, which is the investor-owned uh, trade association for investor-owned utilities. I also used to work for Procter & Gamble, British Telecom, and ITT Corporation when it was the world's largest conglomerate. And I'm currently serving my fifth year on the, research, on the Department of Commerce's Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Advisory Committee. So what all this is about is business. It's about making money. It's about the economy. Now, let me give you one more quote, which comes from Richard Branson himself on climate change. He said, there's no greater time to make wealth than right now because of climate change. In other words, new technologies, new jobs, new industries, things we can be doing to make money and save the planet at the same time. These are not mutually exclusive. So what are we exporting? So here's how we compete against wind and Ch China's wind and solar. We'll be exporting virtual power plants. And the idea of a virtual power plant is this. You have all the renewables talking to each other. They get sighted. So you have wind, solar, hydrokinetic, hydropower. They're all talking to each other. And that creates base load power. Energy storage is part of it. Fuel cells is part of it. CHP is part of it. They're all talking to each other, providing power talk to each other, providing baseload power to microgrids, which is the basis for smart grids and smart cities. Using local in integrated resources is how that all comes together. So how does that happen? Now, I've been talking to the United Nations and the United Nations Development Program. It's this idea. It's the idea of going in, and this is a service the United States can export through our own government, government to government business. We go in to do regional integrated resource planning. And then we do ecosystem cost-benefit analysis. And then we do modeling. And then we do something strange that this country never does. We plan. We create plans. And we make those economic arguments for going into countries with all of the renewables going in with an answer to developing a sustainable community. This very example I'm talking about is underway in the Zambezi Basin, working with the United Nations Development Program, U.S. Trade and Development Agency, to connect five African countries along the Zambezi River Basin, starting with hydropower, then you begin to connect. And the reason you start with hydropower is because it's also part of the water energy nexus. Our systems can be producing clean water while it's producing power, and pumping water for agricultural purposes, and creating water holes to help protect the African elephants from poachers. Okay, so that's what's happening. And also what's happening is an informal coalition is beginning to form. And the coalition is leading to a, here's the catchword, a private-public partnership. Not a public-private partnership. Because governments cannot lead. Business can lead. Innovators can lead. So a private-public partnership is being formed. There's a number of universities, like Cornell University and its Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future are getting behind it. The core of all this is water. So I leave all that with you, because if you want to get involved, let me know. I'll be hanging around, and I'm taking names. OK, great. Um, 
So hopefully we will have time uh, uh, at the end for a little Q&A and, &A and uh, because I think it could all be very engaging. So we also have friends from north of the border. Uh, obviously, uh, the US and Canada have a very, very special uh, relationship. And uh, it's amazing how much clean energy power we get from Canada and in terms of what that means as we look at clean power plans here in the US, uh, what that means economically. So we're happy to once again welcome Jacob Irving, who is the president of Canadian Hydropower Association. Jacob. Thank you once again, Carol, very much for the opportunity to come and talk about Canadian hydropower to our American cousins here. Uh, and to begin with, um, I think I, I'd like to start off by um, reading a, a bit of a humorous piece from the internet. Uh, please don't stop me if you've heard this one before because I think it's instructive. It goes a little something like this. It's a, it's a transcript between a U.S. naval ship and Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland. Some of them have already heard it. So the Americans are on the radio. They say, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. The Canadians respond. Recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The Americans respond, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. The Canadians respond, no, I say again, you divert your course. The American responds, this is the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. And the Canadian responds, well, we're a lighthouse, so you know, your call. <laughs> <laughs> it's so Canadian. <laughs> Us Canadians love that little story. Whether or not it's true is a whole other thing. But um, I think the point, I like the point of the story is that I think as sort of as, as mighty as the United States is, um, you can always use our help. And, Thank you. And, 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 and I also think, actually, I, another, uh, this is so replete with analogies and lessons, this little fable, um, is that uh, I often think about that lighthouse operator and you know, say um, they didn't communicate it properly and say there was an accident. Uh, you can be sure that that lighthouse operator would have had a performance co review with their superiors. Um, it would not do for us Canadians to let you crash upon the rocks. Um, but sometimes uh, what we forget on our side of the border is that it is our job to communicate better to you. We shouldn't be sitting back passively um, expecting you to know things that you may not. And that really is the basis of why I'm here to talk to you today. Um, as I always get the chance through Carol and EESI to do, is I, I get the chance to essentially come and remind the United States of Canadian hydropower, the nature of it, um, how large we are, how we can grow, and how we can help uh, both ourselves in Canada, but also the United States, and to take a bit more of a North American approach to some of the shared climate change objectives, greenhouse gas issues that we've all discussed. So in Canada, from a hydropower perspective, uh, we are the world's third largest generator of hydropower. And that is significant when you think of who number one and number two are. Uh, number one is China, with about 1.6 billion people. Number two is Brazil, with about 230 million people. Number three is Canada, with 35 million people. So we clearly box above our weight class when it comes to hydropower generation. We have one of the cleanest and most renewable electricity systems in the world. Hydropower is our number one source of generation. It's over 63% of the electricity generated in Canada compared to the United States, which is about 70% thermal, combination of natural gas and coal. So uh, we have a very large, very clean, renewable electricity system which we, from which we derive great benefit. Um, but we look south to the United States and we see a desire to improve, clean the electricity system here. And the good news, and the news that I want to make sure I communicate and that I bring to Americans every time I get the chance, is that as large as we are, third largest generator in the world, 
we could still more than double our current install capacity. And that is significant. Another way of looking at it is that if you look at um, OECD countries around the world, um, and you look at who's building new storage hydropower, who's building new large storage hydropower, there's really only two countries, and that's Turkey and Canada. Those are the two countries that, that have the resource at their disposal that are building it and can build more. And why this is important is because we can lend this undeveloped resource to assist the United States. You know, and as Leroy was talking about, um, there's, there's, there's huge potential here uh, domestically with, with hydro. There is the potential to wring more power out of your significant fleet. The, the United States has the third largest installed capacity of hydropower in, in the world. Um, more efficiency and the like, you can wring a lot more power out of that and bring more on. And I know that, that developers here are very strongly engaged on that front. But also, like Leroy mentioned, is uh, there's a lot of non-powered dams. There's a lot of dams in this country that don't have hydro facilities in them at all. And if you can add that, you can bring on significant new domestic uh, resources, which is very impressive. Us up north, Canada, um, we have new storage hydropower that can be built. And the reason why that's important, the reason why that's significant, is because everyone knows that as the new renewables come on, wind and solar, both in the United States and in Canada, that uh, they need a dispatchable backup. And the great thing about hydropower is that for 130 years of history, no other form of generation has succeeded in being more dispatchable than hydropower. Basically, you can turn us on and off faster than any other form of generation. And that is very important if you want to bring on new, more variable resources such as wind and solar. And so Canada has a huge capacity in that regard already, and we have the ability to build even more. And then connect with the United States and help it in its desire to clean its grid and bring on more of its own clean renewable electricity. And this isn't just theory. Uh, we actually have a very interesting project that, that's uh, developing in practice in the middle of our continent. And it's essentially, it's, it's an arrangement between our province of Manitoba and the states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North Dakota. And I know actually Bill Libro is here from Minnesota Power, um, so I might, I might throw questions to him if anybody asks about some of the real details of this. But I can give you the large overview. What it is, is there's a desire in Wisconsin and Minnesota to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions from electricity generation. They'd like to turn down their coal, and they'd like to turn up their renewables. To the west of them is North Dakota, which has one of the greatest wind resources in the world, world-class wind resource, um, but not a huge load center to plug into. Minnesota and Wisconsin offer that. They are the load centers. So they would really like to very much bring in some of that wind into Minnesota and Wisconsin. But for that to be viable, uh, they need a backup. And the best backup that you could ask for, for wind, is, is hydropower. To the north lies Manitoba. Manitoba is 98% hydropower. It is a hydropower developer par excellence uh, with a huge history. They are building a new project, the Kiosk project, and that project will service Manitoba's needs, but there will also be excess that will be able to support the wind power in, the, in North Dakota. And so to boil it all down, what it is, is it's two countries, three states, and one province all getting together across borders to ensure that clean renewable power enables more clean renewable power. And this, to me, is an amazing good news story of international cooperation, as much as it is a story about energy development. Our two countries are working together to bring on each other's clean renewable resources. And there's more potential in that regard from coast to coast in Canada. We have undeveloped hydropower potential east, west, north, throughout the system. And perhaps something to, to end on as I, as I try to attune you to the opportunities that Canada presents and that we offer. Um, you know, it's obviously our hydropower exports are obviously a really big deal to us Canadians. Um, we send you more electricity than you send us. That stands to reason. That's the way things normally work with re natural resources in Canada and the United States. Uh, you have more people than we have. Uh, we are the second largest landmass on the planet. We have a lot of resources. We are a net exporter of all forms of energy. 
and you are generally our customers. So this works between our two nations quite well. And yes, we enjoy a favorable balance of trade and electricity. We send you probably somewhere in the order of about 40 terawatt hours a year of hydropower. And this is, this is mutually beneficial, obviously to us as the generator, but for you as well. This helps displace between a half a million and a million tons of, of carbon your way um, every year. So we're working on this together, we're building it together. But as large and as important as that is to us Canadians, and as much as that delivers to you in terms of reliable electricity and environmental benefits, it represents less than 1% of your electricity consumption overall. So our Canadian hydro is contributing less than 1% of US electricity consumption. Our humble argument is that that could and should grow a little bit. If we went to 2%, that would be a doubling for us Canadians, and I'm not even sure if it would necessarily be noticed that strongly in the United States. <laughs> But it would displace more greenhouse gases, as, as it always has, and it will have the capacity to be able to enable more uh, U.S. renewables as well. So the partnership opportunities are vast. This is a very good news story. I like to think that we can deliver from, from the north to our friends to the south. And really all we have to do is keep doing what we've always been doing, which is getting along, um, coming up with, with uh, natural exchanges between our two systems, helping each other out, balancing each other's needs, and, um, and attacking a common goal together, which I think is essentially reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and cleaning up the North American electricity system. And um, we've been doing it for 130 years. Really all we need to do is keep doing it and uh, do more of it. And uh, I'll be really excited to answer some questions in that regard following the end of the panel. Okay, thank you, Jacob. And um, hopefully, hopefully, if we can stay on on time, we'll we'll be able to do that. Um, and so, I now would like to turn to David Jaco, who is the director of efficiency solutions with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting David just a couple of months ago. Was so impressed by every, everything. <clears throat> sorry, that they were doing there. And of course, we also know that that whole part of California, well, California is really struggling with regard to water and therefore its whole linkage with energy. Right, thank you, Carol. Uh, so I'm gonna change it up a little bit. We've had some great presentations about the supply side. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the demand side now. Uh, how we can do demand side management. Uh, one side note, LADWP operates one of the largest uh, pump storage plants in the world, Castaic, 1,566 megawatts. Uh, we operate our own aqueduct from the Owens Valley where we have a lot of inflow hydro. Uh, and the gentleman's point to, to the right of me, it's all interlinked, power, water, job creation, economic development. Uh, it's all interlinked, inextricably interlinked. And because of that, I'll talk a little bit about our energy efficiency efforts as well as our water efficiency efforts because they really go hand in hand. Uh, on both resources, we have tremendous uh, drivers for uh, looking for new sources of power and water. We consider efficiency a source. Uh, we have integrated efficiency, water efficiency, power efficiency as a supply side resource in our integrated uh, resource planning for both of those resources. And in fact, are looking for it to accommodate about 15% of our energy needs by 2020 uh, and about 20% uh, of our water needs by 2020. We have tremendous drivers in, in Los Angeles, in California, especially Los Angeles, that are putting pressure on supply side resources, traditional supply side resources. Uh, on the power side, we are, uh, we, we are experiencing hotter summers. We've still got tremendous population growth, rising affluence and plug loads. That's, uh, rising affluence is a good thing. The byproduct and plug, plug loads is, is not so much. Um, so those are challenges. But the big one that's coming for all utilities in California is our, our statewide policy push under AB 32, the Greenhouse uh, Global Warming Solutions Act, to electrify the passenger vehicle fleet. Vehicle uh, transportation electrification is a huge uh, policy objective in the state of California, not just, not just light duty vehicles, but also freight and, and uh, shipping uh, uh, dockside power as well. But where it affects the utility most specifically is with the light duty passenger vehicles. We have estimated that a full conversion of the, of the passenger vehicle fleet in the city of Los Angeles will double our load 
Uh, we will go from retailing 24,000 gigawatt hours per year to 48,000 gigawatt hours per year. That's tremendous, tremendous increase in, in consumption uh, and tremendous amount of growth over a short period of time. So we're very constrained on, on the, uh, we've got tremendous drivers driving load and you know, the ability to bring on new resources, uh, traditional supply side resources is, is very challenging, citing power plants, we're doing renewables, we're doing lots of renewables, but again, uh, matching that kind of load is challenging. So that's, you know, that, that leads us to really be focused on energy efficiency on the power side. And on the water side, we don't necessarily have the same growth drivers, but here's where we're really constrained on the supply side, the traditional supply side. Uh, we're in the midst of a four-year exceptional drought. The last four years are the, the driest period of four years on record in the city of Los Angeles. The drought we're in in, in California is pretty much unprecedented in recorded California history. The snowpack, uh, which is our reservoir that falls in the Sierra Nevada over the, over the winter and then slowly melts through the summer, keeping the reservoirs full, that feed the aqueducts that move the water from where it lands to where it's needed, are, uh, was virtually zero April 1. Uh, there was no snowpack. Just astounding. So what's in the reservoirs is what's in the reservoirs. Now we've got a lot, we've, we've built a tremendous amount of reservoirs in the last few years. It'll tide us through, but we're really hoping that the signs of the El Nino that we've been seeing with the flooding in Texas and the Midwest is a harbinger of a wet winter for California. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, not having that, we are in full efficiency and conservation mode. Turf removal is a big one. Uh, we are, we are de-landscaping. Uh, Los Angeles. If you go back 150 years, if you went to Los Angeles, it was uh, lots of native plants. Let's put it like that. Uh, it's a desert. You know, it's a temperate desert, but it's a desert. Then we terraformed it as if we had gone to Mars and created this lush, <laughs> this lush, you know, uh, Southern California lifestyle uh, of turf and you know, inappropriate plants, high water, uh, high water type varieties, etc. Lush landscapes. Well, we're we're working to yank that out now. It's a it's a it's a cultural shift. It's a painful process, but uh, you know it it's, it it has to be done because the you know the water supply just isn't there to maintain that. So that is a huge driver for us in in the programs we run. Now we've made a long term commitment to these to these programs uh, to these investments. Like I said, we're making this we're making efficiency in both energy and water a supply side investment. We're investing upwards of 200, 100 to 200, growing to $200 million a year in energy efficiency. So between here and 2020, we're going to invest over a billion dollars in energy efficiency, uh, for which we, we will save the, the equivalent of two 2,000 megawatt power plants. And you can't build a 4,000 megawatt power plant for $1.2 billion. Uh, but you can if you build it out of efficiency. Uh, same thing on the water side. We're investing upwards of, of $60 million a year in water conservation. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with water price, wholesale water prices. Uh, we have seen our, our wholesaler is the, is the, the legendary uh, and infamous Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. I can say that because I'm with the legendary and infamous Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. <laughs> Uh, and we have seen wholesale rates on water go from $200 an acre foot to $1,200 an acre foot over the last six or seven years. And they will continue to rise. Uh, we expect we're probably not more than four or five years away from $2,000 an acre foot, at which, at which point all sorts of uh, other measures are cost effective. Uh, water efficiency is always cost effective, even at $200 an acre foot. But at $1,200 to $2,000 an acre foot, you can really start doing some, some amazing things. Uh, we've been running a turf removal program that incentivizes customers at, at, uh, to, to, to remove turf and replace it with a California-friendly landscape, no bare dirt, uh, la friendly landscape, at $3.75 a square foot. Uh, now, up until recently, we had, we had to put some controls in recently because we were giving away a tremendous amount of money. But uh, up until recently, before those controls went in place, uh, it stepped down to $3 per square foot, but then there was no limit. Well, $3 a square foot is $140,000 an acre. We're going to $140,000 an acre for turf removal. That's the price of land in, in the good part of the U.S. Now, not in California, necessarily. But uh, it's just, it just puts it in perspective. And that was cost effective. The water saved uh, over, the, you know, over 10 or 20 years pays back that investment. Us not having to procure, buy that water from Metropolitan or, or you know, build a desal plant, which 
there's a, a lot of interest in from the business side, um, but a lot of pushback from the policy side and the environmental side, uh, as well with you know whatever homeowners, uh, property owners happen to be in, on that part of the coast. Uh, it, it's 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 more cost effective to do the the conservation route. Uh, one thing that I really want to stress, and so this is this is what I'm going to end with, but I'm not rushing out of it because it's really important. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of the audience here is, is obviously, since we're here, staff, representatives, uh, uh, electeds, uh, representatives of electeds, et cetera. Uh, a lot of times I find that when I get in front of an audience like this and I talk efficiency and I talk demand side management, uh, yeah, that's, that's nice, but at a certain point, after a certain point, it kind of becomes wah, 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 wah. Okay, so I'm going to throw a word in there that will get you back thinking, and the word is jobs. Jobs. So efficiency, energy and water efficiency efforts are a prime driver of job creation. And we've heard all about the solar industry. The solar industry is a shining star of job creation in the state of California. 54,000 jobs in the solar industry. That's great. Uh, on, on the backs of billions and billions of dollars invested. We have, uh, I've, we've always sensed that, that efficiency was a more uh, cost effective job creation stimulus pathway than many others because it's more labor intensive than materials intensive. Uh, so we studied it and produced this uh, in concert with UCLA, uh, the Luskin Center of Public Policy. We analyze energy efficiency job creation from the investment we're, we're, we are making in our programs. And sure enough, we found that our programs generate 16 jobs per million dollars invested. And jobs per million invested is pretty much the benchmark of job creation from various stimulus pathways. That compares to natural gas development at 5.2 jobs per million invested, residential new construction, you know, construction starts, uh, new homes, that's the big, big bellwether of the economy nationwide, 10.7 jobs per million, smart grid deployment, we're getting there, 12.5, solar generation, 13.7, a lot of jobs there too, but even more jobs per million come from investments in, in energy efficiency. Uh, I know we're talking water. We did this three years before this one for water, found the same thing, 16, 17 jobs per million dollars invested. Same thing, labor intensive, less materials intensive. There's a, mul there's, there, there's a, uh, a multiplicative job creation, local job creation benefit from that because the materials uh, that creates jobs, but quite often overseas, uh, in China, offshore manufacturing, or in the case of uh, the, you know, the natural gas development and fracking, out of state. And so if you're local to the, to the, you know, the concerns of the local electorate, which we are as, a, as the uh, utility serving the city of Los Angeles, uh, we, we, we could care less about a job in North Dakota as much as we could care less about a job in China. You know, it's just that's, that's because our, uh, our local and state level uh, you know, electeds and constituent constituencies care about those local job impacts. Efficiency gives you that, whether, whether it's the energy side or the, the water side. So, I'm going to put in a plug. I have more of these. I'm at table T11 out there in the, in the other room. Uh, and I will be giving these away until they're gone. Uh, and we also, for our, our aggressive energy and water efficiency targets out through 2020, we developed a detailed business plan that explains how we plan to achieve it. Market segments, strategies, incentives, uh, Bar uh, customer barrier, buy downs, etc. The whole plan is here to achieve the lofty goals we've established for 2020 in energy and water efficiency. I have copies of these as well. So please stop by, take them off my hands so I don't have to lug them out of here like I had to lug them in here this morning. Thank you. Uh, we'll now turn to Dr. Daniel Farb, who is the CEO with uh, Pioneer Valley Renewables and Leviathan Energy Group. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm first going to talk about my technologies and then about policy. Um, I moved from Los Angeles to Israel 10 years ago to get into the technology world. I moved back to the United States uh, two years ago to bring them to market. I got interested in renewable energy and decided that I wanted to make game-changing innovations that would save the planet. And I, so far I filed around 30 patents in different areas. i first like to tell you a little bit about them. They're somewhat related by being influenced by a discipline called computational fluid dynamics. That sounds like a mouthful. I'm going to make it really easy for you. Uh, imagine that there's wind blowing at one meter per second. The relationship between power output and velocity 
Power is related to the velocity cubed. So that's one times one times one, one light bulb. If you increase that velocity to two meters per second, then you get two times two times two, which is eight light bulbs just by increasing the velocity by one meter per second. So you take that, and then on top of it, let's say you apply it to water, you multiply it by 1,000 because of the density of water as opposed to wind. So you work with this kind of uh, enhancement of power, and we make geometries that can cause the speed to be higher at the point where it hits the blades. And now let's see how some of it applies. So first I'm going to talk about hydrokinetic power. I'd like to thank the NHA for inviting me to come here and speak. Um, uh, my company called Pioneer Valley Renewables makes underwater turbines. They can be used in rivers, canals, tides, and ocean currents. In November, we did a demonstration in the Connecticut River Canal System in Massachusetts, and it demonstrated that we were making well over 100% more power per water speed than the conventional three-bladed uh, regular uh, underwater turbines. Uh, that's a game changer, and we're now negotiating our first contracts. Um, and I'd appreciate, by the way, if everybody in the audience can think of places in their districts where we could do this kind of thing. So this efficiency advantage is so high that we can afford to manufacture this in the United States, and we are planning to manufacture in the United States, mostly in a depressed industrial area in Massachusetts, but using as many other suppliers from the United States as possible, and also in the local locations. Um, and the same technology can also be applied to small and medium-sized wind turbines, uh, and we hope to get into that as well. Technology number two, we call it the wind energizer. Now, I'm going to wave a magic wand, and I'm going to show you how we can improve the power output of the very large wind turbines and wind farms by at least 30% without even touching the turbine. Now, that may sound like magic, but what we do is we use the discipline of computational fluid dynamics to make models of the wind turbine, the wind and the terrain, and we make structures maybe 50 meters, maybe 100 meters away from the turbine that change the wind before it hits the turbine. It's a uh, very unique, innovative solution, and it works. We've proven it on a small scale. Uh, and this is something everybody should think about for their district because it's a great job creator. After the high-tech work is done, it's farmed out to local construction and uh, installation firms and metal fabrication firms, and this can be huge for all the wind farms all over the country. And what's more, because it lowers the effective speed at which a wind turbine starts to turn, uh, is that it opens up new areas of the country for wind energy. Next technology. We make small wind tulips for flat roofs. Now, they're beautiful. That's why we call them tulips. They're quiet and have low vibration, but there are two major impacts on the cost of energy. And those are, one, that they start at lower speeds than other turbines. And two, this is what I call more zoom in less room. Um, there's a cluster effect. They're designed in such a way, and this is one of the patent pending things that I have, um, is that if you place them at the right distance next to each other, one improves its neighbor by 20%. Most wind turbines you need to separate, make it far away. Now, this is a game changer because if you were to imagine where would the solar industry be if you had to put one panel on one end of a roof and another panel on the other end of the roof and nothing in between. So this opens the capability to make rooftop wind farms. Okay, uh, next one I'll talk about, final technology I'll talk about today, is in-pipe hydroelectric. It's applying hydroelectric to piping systems. Every piping system around the world has areas where there, are, where there is excess pressure, pressure that you don't need to run the system. Now, what usually happens is the water utility either lets it leak, and that's of course important for people like you, um, or, they put in a pressure breaker, which wastes this pressure as heat. Imagine having a pressure breaker that can make you money, 
and give you the right pressure that you need to run your system at the exit. So this is a unique approach. And the application is not only for water utilities, but even uh, sustainable buildings. If you look at a building like this, it's probably being cooled right now by water circulation. And there's probably a chiller in the basement that the water is flowing back into continuously. That's building up energy that we can partially recover uh, by putting in a turbine in the pipeline that's descending. Uh, if anybody knows the engineer for this building, please let me know afterwards. OK, so let me suggest some policy measures that would help. Number one, encourage innovation. Now, I've been busy with innovation myself. Uh, everything I'm doing is at an early commercialization stage. It takes money. As Trey pointed out, um, the amount of money going for research and development is very low. The number of good ideas that get turned away for government support is very high. You just simply have to put in more money, or you're not going to get the innovation, and you're not going to get the new jobs. Now, when you put in this money, it's important to make rules that it should go to small companies that need it, and for fundamental, not just incremental, technology. In other words, if there's a game changer. Now, the fact is, is the way most people are, most people in corporations and most reviewers for uh, the Department of Energy, um, they don't like to stick their necks out with something new. So unless you write into the rules or the laws that the money is to go to fundamentally new approaches, um, then it's not going to go there. Um, another area to revise is SBA loans. Now, if I were running a nail salon and wanted to expand my business, I can get money more easily from the SBA than if I have a high-tech firm that could turn into a billion-dollar company. Uh, so that should be revised in such a way uh, <laughs> that um, we can do something about it. Another thing is, um, as everyone pointed out, there are a lot of unused dams in the US. If you were to fund hydrokinetic, as an alternative to putting the old Francis or other kinds of turbines in place, um, that would open that up for hydrokinetic to do what it does. Hydrokinetic means you don't have to stop the water and then start it again. You have the extra energy from not stopping the flow. I'll make the rest fast. Uh, another area is patents. It sometimes seems like the patent office is trying to increase its fees. They find all sorts of great ways to deny you a patent. And sometimes they get very silly. Um, so that, And it's not just the US that does it. It's other countries. I've heard that China purposely does it this way uh, as part of their overall economic strategy. I don't know if that's true or not. But I did hear it from somebody who heard it from somebody who worked in the Chinese patent office. Um, these are all things that can be worked on and make it easier for innovative companies to put their money into more important things. OK, so uh, I'm getting messages to stop. I'd just like to say, that, conclude that we can do the transition to a sustainable economy if we have the right vision, will, policies, and funding. And in this transition, hydropower has the greatest density of power. And we should do whatever we can to help reduce the red tape that's involved in bringing it to market. Thank you. Lots of interesting stuff there. Sorry that we are literally running out of time uh, because you've all got so much great stuff to say. Uh, but we, because we started a little bit late and uh, we have one speaker uh, remaining who also has some very important uh, uh, messages for us today too, and that's Thomas Horner, who is the Vice President with Water Management, Inc. And obviously this is all about water management, what we've been talking about. What? Can you do, no more than five. How's that? Okay. What's Good really afternoon. important for us? I first of all wanted to thank Carol and EESI. They've done a great job for the last 19 years, I, I believe, on the Hill. And it's not just this annual symposium, it's every week. They're educating the people up here on both the Senate and the representative side. They do a wonderful job. 
you need to go to their website if you haven't and attend some of their sessions. Wanted to thank the senators and the congressmen that are here and a lot of their aides that are really the staff is the ones that go out of their way to give the proper information to the upper level folks to form our policy. And we're becoming a lot more sustainably minded in the country. Uh, due to time factor, we'll constrict a lot of things, but water management, we've done large scale water efficiency programs, mostly on the East Coast. We have an office here in Alexandria, one in Nashville and one in Dallas. We kind of work off the philosophy that the bottom line of green, the sustainable movement, is black. That's an accounting term. The difficulty we've always had in the West Coast is they figured out a way to greatly undercharge for the water they provide. When you undercharge for something that's incredibly valuable, people use a lot of it. I believe what's going to happen in LA and most of California within the next year and a half is they had slack in the system. They're spending a lot of money wisely they're going to be a repeat of what happened to Seattle, I believe, 12 years ago. Seattle was into a crisis drought. They went out and got everybody involved. They saved 28% the first year. Water utilities operate quite differently than electric and gas utilities. The two main differences are that electric and gas, the commodity, is about 70% plus of what you pay on your bill. In water, the infrastructure cost is 70% plus of what you pay on your bill. So when you have a 28% savings, and that's my over-under for what LA is going to do next year, you have to double your rate within three years. It's going to change the whole dynamic. He's talking about going from $2 an acre foot to $1,200 an acre foot. And that's the one thing that always amazed me about the California water professionals that I knew. They talked in acre feet, where we on the West Coast talk in I mean, East Coast, talking thousands of gallons. So there's going to be a great increase in efficiency, which will lead to an increase in the cost. Uh, we've set up a program, we call it the WOLF program, Water Optimization and Low Flow Program. We've set up our first major mechanical contractor in San Diego. We've been doing this 35 years. And everything we've done is based on ROI, return on investment, and internal rate of return for our clients. We have a lot higher rates, three to five times what California has. We do not decouple the wastewater from the water fee. So it's all based on consumption. Uh, we have 54,000 water authorities in the country with 54,000 different rate structures. The difficulty that we'll have in the near future is how do we properly pay for the most valuable entity that mankind has ever known? Without clean, pure, safe water and disposal, you don't have a civilization. So in my 20 seconds left, AWWA, Water Works Association Conference, the general manager of DC Water was asked at a panel, 
how many jobs, we were talking about jobs, are you responsible for in the District of Columbia? George Hawkins stepped to the microphone and said, every single one of them. Without a water authority, you don't have civilization. It's the cheapest $3, less than four cents for 10 gallons of water. Biggest bargain in the world. We got to make it a lot more expensive, and we're going to be doing that in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, th thank, you, thank you. And sorry for uh, feeling rushed and everything, because this is just a critical, critical issue because we cannot survive without water. And it's so dependent upon uh, how we use it, how we consume it, and it's also so important in terms of the energy that it provides. And, and this huge nexus is fascinating, very, very important. So go see all these guys. And thank you all very, very much for being here. We're now going to move to our next panel immediately. Thank you.